fintechs have very much exploded onto the space in a very short span of time. I mean, we're, India's home to what, 2,000, 3,000 plus fintechs. A bulk of them have just come about, by the way, in only the last five years. We have some 33 unicorns, we have 22 sunicorns and whatnot. Uh, you know, what, what I want to ask, however, is what next? Uh, how has the role of fintechs evolved and how it will continue to evolve to be able to lend to the new economy? And since we have a panel of experts, as you can see, a lot of them specifically catering to a certain segment of society, we'll also cover how they're trying to bring uh, about inclusion for, uh, you know, the female borrowers as well. So on that note, thank you all very much for being here again. And Shinjini, I'll start with you about the role of fintechs itself. You know, traditionally you had the banking model, uh, the gaps that they couldn't fill was filled by NBFCs. Uh, further down the line you had MFIs, the payment banks, and then technology encompasses everything. Um, are fintechs in the future going to remain these ancillaries, so to speak? Or do you think they can be the disruptors we thought they'd be when they emerged onto the space but didn't really get that far? So uh, let me start out by saying that um, you, you, you contextualize this in the context of lending because you took the example of um, largely NBFCs and banks. And of course NBFCs are also non-lending NBFCs. But one of the advantages in the age of new technology, which is the platform economy or the digital or the mobile or whatever where we are living now, is this ability to bring together a lot of the financial products, which has never been a ability that the financial system has had. So because traditionally financial system uh, has been built because distribution channels had to be built manually, so they were typically created vertical by vertical. I mean, I ran a consumer bank and we would even as late as now, we would have verticals that were wealth, credit cards, lending, secure lending, like that, right? But the, what this platform um, provides us, to, you know, enables us to do is to bring all of this together. So a person is the user. So you as a user on Amazon are a holistic person who can be buying all different types of products, right? But it's you as a user and the platform as the platform. Unfortunately, in financial services, it's very divided. So insurance, um, wealth, lending are separate. So to my mind, what will really change the game is that we all talk about data, right? In the previous section, session, we talked about data since, since the afternoon we've been talking about data. So today what's happening is the data is being created. But the ability to use that data to cater to a customer in a wholesome way is still very constrained for various reasons. I'm not going to get into that, and I'm sure there are everybody else on this uh, panel who will have a view. But to my mind, the real game changer will be that ability to actually, then you, what Mr. Kama said, now fit, hair, free, hair. To make it fit and to make it free, you actually need to be able to pull that power together. Today we are not there. So, yeah. Uh, you know, on that fit hair, free hair note, let me ask Srinivasu actually, because he's actually in the payment space, uh, especially when we talk about UPI transactions, etc. Bohat fit hai and bilkul free hai. Is that the right business model for companies who are for profit? Uh, you know, especially companies like you that remain in the pure play payment space haven't really ventured into the lending tech space, which many of your peers seem to be doing. Before I answer that, I'll just address the earlier question Shinjini answered. Over the last seven, eight years that I've done many of these forums, the question, debate has gone from will fintech upstage banks yes. to saying will they compete with banks to then saying will they collaborate with banks to your now question will they just become ancillaries. <laughs> so that's an... Uh, interesting way the space has moved. Uh, and in part, that is addressed by your question to me, which is that, and what Mr. Kamath referred to earlier in his session, uh, technology, innovation, capital availability, all spurred uh, the fintech space in a certain way. But it's end of the day a regulated space, and uh, it's a space for serious players. The entry bar was historically low, uh, which enable innovation to happen rapidly, which is why you see a number of fintechs and number of business models. So there have been definite pluses from that environment. Uh, what has also spurred the growth is, is the host of things came together, COVID, UPI, people having to transact, uh, regulatory framework, uh, government policy, which, which saw vision of saying that if you make uh, the 
UPI is a, uh, a free payment method, digital payments will advance very rapidly. So that's kind of come true. Uh, with that said, therefore, we're all at a, a very key point that uh, payments are going rapidly. Uh, they man a majority of them are mandated to be free. So where do you make money? That question still remains unanswered. I think from an industry perspective, there is, uh, there is hope that at some point as markets or the product stabilizes uh, revenue or factor on that can come back. But in the short run, yes, fintechs are looking at other divergent ways to where they can make revenue and profits. Well, I think the fintechs are quite hopeful. If you talk about hope, just look at the payment aggregator license applications. I think some 180, 200 companies have applied to be payment aggregators. Is there really space for a 201st player to now come into the ecosystem in a way be able to grab a larger market share? Or do you think the space itself is too commoditized by now at this point of time? My views on this topic are fairly well known. I think when we talk of technology-based companies, whether it's India or anywhere in the world, there's never space for more than 10. There is a process of evolution where hundreds compete to be in the 10. It's just a question of who survives to be in the top 10. So who, who will survive? Who will be the top 10 that, that, in the current crop of tell. players that, that we have? I will tell. If we all had the crystal ball, the remaining 190 would never participate, right? Okay. Uh, since you're not giving us that list, so Charita, let me come to you. Uh, you know, the point that uh, Srinivasu also raised, first we started with fintechs, uh, you know, taking over uh, some of the banking operations, and we said they'll collaborate, and now we're talking of them as ancillaries. Um, where do you stand on this uh, particular matter, and do you think there are gaps that fintechs are able to fill, which in, you know, even in the future, as banks become more and more tech first, they will probably not be you know, able to get into. Yeah, so um, I just want to um, build on Shinjini's point around uh, uh, just the way our financial services system is built. It's built um, like product manufacturers. So uh, in some sense, uh, customers need solutions, uh, holistic solutions. So for example, in India, 90% of India actually works in the informal sector, which has tremendous volatility of both income as well as expenses, as much as 45-50%. And uh, therefore, by definition, uh, you need to combine savings and credit, for example. And you probably need insurance for shocks as well. Now, for this customer who is extremely time poor, time is money, to say that, okay, now you will need to go to a bank for savings, to an NBFC for lending, and to XYZ insurance company for insurance, yeah. it's simply not going to happen. And the costs of distribution are going to multiply. Fintechs have a role in bringing all of this together into making this one coherent solution. Fintechs also have a role in inclusion. Apps. Are you referring to fintechs becoming super apps, offering all sorts of BFSI services onto yes. one platform? Uh, you know, it could be uh, in the super app format, um, uh, you know, in a supermarket sense, but finance is very different from FMCG products, right? It's not like soaps. Uh, that you just go and, you know, look at 10 brands and I buy, I don't know, the pink one like Barbie. Um, uh, <laughs> just given, given the movie's popular. Uh, so it's, it's not like that, right? So you need advice. Um, and there is inherent advice whenever you sell a financial service because a financial service manufacturer is always making a call inherently in the sale that this product is good for you. Now what fintechs can do is really understand the customer, what the customer needs, and bring the right set of products together. So yes, combine the products, but not like a supermarket, much more like a curator. Okay, combine the products, but not like a supermarket. Chetna, let me ask you, you know, fintechs don't have the legacy problems of traditional banks. They're empowered with a whole lot of data that they could use to make lending where perhaps traditional players cannot. Why is it that we still see, and as we were talking about before, uh, you know, fintechs even today solving for the problem of that one or that 10% of the population not really going down to the last mile, uh, with a few exceptions, of course. So let me say that, uh, you know, what fintechs are not doing it or instead of saying that, I feel very strongly that uh, on the supply side, where are we failing to listen to people? 
And for bringing that, I would just like to narrate that how actually the fintechs or the banks or the financial sector can learn from the people. And I would just like to narrate how Mandeshi Bank or how, what were the learnings we had from the women. I mean, we keep on talking about the borrowings and lending to the people. And even when we talk about the financial inclusion, we talk about the lending. But sometimes you see that people, I mean, in our case, when I mean, nearly two and a half decades back, everything, everyone would think that, you know, women need, we need to lend poor women, right? But with me, it was like, Women came forward and they said, I don't. I mean, Kanta Bai, who was a street vendor, she said that, I don't want loan, I want to do savings. And banks were not ready to provide that product which will allow her to save three rupees or five rupees a day. And she said, I went to different banks and banks denied opening the account because she's not an affordable client. And so then you said that, okay, if banks are not opening the account, why not start a bank for women like Kanta Bai who want to save five or 10 rupees a day? And that's how we applied for the banking license. Of course, the license was denied by Reserve Bank of India because these promoting members coming with a community capital they couldn't read and write. So the bank, RBI said that we cannot issue the license. Now the whole thing is that community is coming with the capital, not with the investor's capital. We want to save. And so then women said that, okay, we will go to Reserve Bank of India. And you know what they said? They said we cannot read and write, but we can count. Ask us to calculate the interest of any principal amount. If we fail, don't issue the license, but tell your officers to do it without calculator and see who can calculate faster. <laughs> Needless to say, we got the banking license, right? <laughs> but I would, but you know what I would like to say is here the lessons are that even if we don't go to school, we can manage the fintech product, we can do the digital banking, and the challenge is on the supply side that how do you make the life easier for them? That is number one. Understand their cash flow, understand their ecosystem, and provide the solutions. So I would say, Ritu, that what I have learned from the last mile population, either it is for banking or it is for fintech, the one lesson I have learned is never give poor solutions to poor people. If you do that, you are successful. bank licenses were given in 2015, there was so much jubilation about the kind of inclusion that they would bring about and what kind of transformational power they would have. You know, just eight years down the line, we barely have four or five of those 11 players still in business. And I know you're constrained in the fact that you cannot give out loans, that a bulk of your deposits have to be invested in government securities. But, you know, how do you see this business model evolving? Is it sustainable? Do you think in future we will not have more payment banks? Or do you think at some point you'll have to look at lending to live and to continue to survive? Coming to this uh, previous point, out of 200 payment aggregators, 10 will survive. In payments bank case, out of 10, only 5 have survived. So numbers actually don't really make uh, any sense of it. But more importantly is how do you make the business model out of it? So as uh, Kamat Saab also said that when you need to do business, you need to bring the cost down to a level that it becomes near zero. I think the opportunity in front of us, whether it's a payments bank or any other bank, is how technology will enable us to bring the cost to near zero. And that is really the model in which we build up the payments bank. Rather than going in the conventional manner of sending up branches or ATMs or a huge cost on the entire field force and everything else, we, we enable a lot of merchants. We now have 14 lakh plus merchants who enable banking at the doorstep of our customer. And I completely agree poor people don't need poor solutions and don't need things for free. Now I'll also give you an example is that if a person is ready to pay 30, 40 rupees for a transaction, if, mind you, if, any, if I ask anybody in the room, Nobody will pay a penny for doing a transaction. 
But the poor people, uh, poor person is able to pay 30, 40 rupees because the alternate cost to him is far higher. If he has to go to a branch, he will have to sacrifice half day of his earnings. He will have to travel, means time, cost, which will enable. So then that technology enablement through the payments bank ecosystem has actually achieved the financial inclusion mandate for which the payments bank were set. Obviously, the technology and digital has become quite, uh, quite big now. Fino started as a physical company. Now we are nearly 25% of our transactions are on UPI. It is moving into a physical to a digital model now. What we also believe is getting the model right by building up a cost light model, but a scalable model, getting your DNA in place. If you want to really service the poor person or the people on the ground, the 900, 800 million people, you can't sell a Mercedes to a guy who wants a Maruti. So product has to be developed for the purpose of the purpose of the person who you are trying to serve. So most of the banks and everybody has a DNA where they want to serve a different category of people. For servicing this kind of mass population, you need to have a common man of the country. You need to have an, have an ability to scale your business and ability to serve him the right product, the right cost. I think that is some of the factors which helped us but grow our she, business. Are you worried about scalability? Because while you're talking about this, I know you're also applying for a small finance bank license. So when I look at the payments bank model, uh, we, have, we have grown six times in the last six years, from 200 crores top line when we applied for the bank to 1,200 crores last year. One of the very few payments banks were profitable. We also went listed about a year and a half back. So we have done all the, I would say, all the right things which have to be done for any bank. And as Mr. Kamath also said, you need to be profitable. I think that is a big test for any payments company. And if you look around all the fintechs, you will find very few fintechs who are actually uh, profitable. Maybe a okay. couple of us are <laughs> sitting here, but <laughs> so, <laughs> very difficult to find otherwise. But uh, yeah. for us, the small, fund ban is, uh, small finance bank license is a payments bank plus plus model. Hmm. It enables us to do more on the liability side. It's also enabled us to offer a lending product to a customer which is already there. Let me ask you, Srinivasu, what are fintech players getting wrong? I mean, uh, you know, you became profitable within six years of operations, and I recall you saying that you had raised only three and a half million dollars. That's all. And you know, this frenzy of funding that we've seen in the fintech companies, the high cash burn, and, and still, you know, profitability is far away. What are they doing wrong? I know we're talking about a period that was a little while back and circumstances have changed, but what would be your lessons uh, that you could share with them? I think let's look at what the fintechs did right. Mm. They saw a market in which there was uh, capital available uh, to experiment and to build. Uh, so they figured they, how to leverage that, right? The market didn't put a premium or a priority to figuring out the right business model or profitability. So they did things right. They understood the market they were catering to, which at that point was the investor, and they uh, did things right. Now, and basis that, they've looked at speed to market as being the, the key thing to work on. And so you build a cost model to achieve that objective. As the framework changes, I think what did they get wrong? Uh, I think what, what the market as a whole uh, has gotten wrong is to believe that this would stay unregulated. Right? The moment you put a regulatory framework, or you anticipate a regulatory framework, there is a way you look at business and cost that's inevitable to come. So I think that's the, that's the transition phase. Uh, it's come at a point when people will kind of clean up their racks to figure out how to become profitable. Okay, uh, so Charita, let me pick up from there on the regulatory aspect of it. You know, uh, first they were unregulated. You know, it was often said that there was light touch regulation. Now with the digital lending guidelines and, you know, a series of circulars from RBI, whether it is almost killing the BNPL model and whatnot, how has life changed for you in the last couple of years? Do you think, you know, fintechs need to necessarily look at being regulated, getting an NBFC license to survive in this ecosystem? I don't think so. I, I think that both models will coexist uh, and the digital lending guidelines with the first loss um, uh, of 5% now becoming a reality, um, uh, you know, actually now makes it possible, uh, right, uh, for um, digital players to exist. Now, th the 5% has many implications. It means that you need to get your underwriting right uh, because you can't put unlimited first loss. Uh, you 
you know, and you can't buy your way uh, through a partnership. And therefore, the underwriting model really needs to be uh, correct. To go back to your previous point and to Srinivas's previous point, customer unit economics have to be positive. Uh, right? Uh, uh, that was sort of one of the golden rules, 101 rules of any business, whether it's a fintech business, uh, whether it's an FMCG business, whether it's a bank, the customer at a unit level over a period of time must be profitable. Shinjiri, would you say Sucharita is one of the exceptions? Because, you know, a lot of these new rules that have come in have really disrupted the business model of certain players. Some of them even went out of business. Is the industry and the regulator not on the same page? So I'll, I'll come to that later because the thought that's been playing in my mind is this, um, it is, I don't actually agree that when you, that, uh, you know, the expectation that you will start to make money uh, and only then you will be valuable is correct. Because if that's how the world was built, then the world would have never changed. The world has only ever changed when capital has moved to frontiers, whether it is the gold diggers of, uh, you know, America, or whether it is the Silicon Valley people, or whether it is, uh, you know, Indian fintech, which has been, so, you know, uh, people's habits are hard to change. And ask me, because I am trying to build a, a fintech for women, non-men, because, you know, men tend to be primary customers of financial services. I'm seeing this room and I'm thinking, oh, yes, good. And uh, so what happens is that you realize that for, and all of you have, know many women in your lives, right? Now think about how hard it is for this woman to, even if she understands that there are platforms available, to change from that habit of simply asking you on a Saturday morning to do something because, you know, you'll not do the dishes, you'll not take the child for the thing. So you will probably be the person who, can, who will be happy to talk to the investment advisor. So that's what you will do while she'll be planning the party. She'll be as educated, she went to the same college and everything. But that's how the division of labor works. Now think about that person's habit changing from doing that to now doing this, which is I will do this myself. That habit change will never happen on a unit economics logic. That will only happen on the logic of, you know, driving that change. Now, uh, it's this, I don't know how many people here started to cook during COVID. A lot of men started to cook during COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, we cooked before COVID also. So a lot of men started cooking during COVID. And all of a sudden, you had, you know, food where ingredients being delivered in sexy packages to homes. And suddenly everybody was a chef. Everybody was showing off nice food. Uh, men started washing clothes and some laundry company came up with a detergent ad for men. So you know what I'm saying? The equivalent of that, the equal and opposite of that to do, to change behavior of a customer who's not used to doing things in a certain way, requires capital. Now, if you're a profit maker, if you're Hindustan Unilever, you will take that capital out of one pocket and you will say, I am investing it into this new set of customer. Let men start buying detergent. They'll buy expensive detergent. It pleases their ego, put some color on it and sell it to them. You can do it from your existing profit pools. But if you're a disruptor, if you don't have that capital that's coming out of your pockets, then you need that source of capital because otherwise that person has, anybody who's vested in the ecosystem is not going to drive that change. All right. Uh, thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Uh, Chetna, Sucharita, Shinjini, Srinivasu, Rishi, all of you, thank you very much for your time here. We're going to conclude it on that note. And thank you all for being a wonderful audience.